Jo, I'm Laurie from EY and have the absolute pleasure of moderating this panel, the role of finance standards and ratings and the role that they have in creating nature as an asset class. So perhaps this is the most eagerly awaited panel of the day um, with all of the questions around how we're going to um, fill the gap of 700 billion. So on the panel, I have um, Yoen Murray from Hermes, Federated Hermes, Tommy Ricketts, Sinclair Vincent, and Stefan Lago. So I'm gonna start the um, panel with a question to Yoen from Hermes, Federated Hermes, around the definition of an asset class, a natural or a nature asset class. Great question, Laurie. Um, I think there are four things for me that are necessary for an asset class to exist. The first is some source of economic benefit. And if you weren't convinced by that wonderful presentation from Ralph, I don't know if you ever will be. However, you could go to Sarpatha Dasgupta's report. It's 610 pages in full. If you want the abridged, it's just 103. Or if you've only got time for the headlines, just the 10 pages. So that would be a really good place to start. Assets in an asset class should broadly have similar characteristics. Now, I think for uh, when we're talking nature, I don't think that necessarily is always true. Again, we saw from Ralph's presentation the diversity that exists within nature as we start to think about it as an asset class, just thinking about flora versus fauna alone. We should also have assets that are broadly subject to the same laws and regulations. And again, nuanced answer here. I think to some extent, assets in nature are, but it clearly varies wildly by jurisdiction and by domicile. So let's just say work to be done on that particular aspect. And then lastly, they should generally respond to the same economic fluctuations to be considered as a grouping of assets within an asset class. I think, broadly speaking, that is true. Again, Ralph said it better than I can, that when we're looking at nature as an asset class, many of the things that we will choose to invest in will have very, uh, a very low or little, almost no correlation to the broad economic factors that we are so used to. So overall, I'm going for yes, it is. But it's a nascent asset class, and there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. And then from a standards perspective, Sinclair, can you offer some reflections around the standard element of it? Sure, yeah, I think, first of all, if we're going to use the words nature and asset together and start applying economics and finance concepts to nature, we have to have standards in place. Um, and for environmental markets like carbon or, or nature, to really work and to scale, um, we need a shared understanding of what that tradable unit or asset is and what it represents and what it doesn't. Um, so I think standards bodies like Vera and others can help bring that sort of definition um, to what these units actually represent, um, as well as a lot of the infrastructure that standards bodies already have, like um, running you know, proper multi-stakeholder development processes, um, figuring out how you actually define and account for um, social and environmental outcomes is something that's already being done um, in, in other areas, other assets. Um, so we can bring that same sort of experience and expertise to this new market, nature assets. Um, and then also, you know, principles that we base a lot of our work on um, around kind of balancing rigor and practicality, focusing on equity, um, embedding, you know, uh, benefit sharing mechanisms, all these types of things do need to be standardized to some extent to, to make sure that there's credibility in a new market um, and can actually allow it to scale over time. And so this morning we heard about the international standard bodies and so forth. So from a VERA perspective, what's the interconnectivity internationally across jurisdictions for the, for the asset classes? Yeah, I mean, this is a tricky one. There's no sort of ton of CO2 equivalent uh, for nature. So it's, it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, but what we do know is that we need to be aligned with these international frameworks that are coming out, you know, things like 
I'll keep saying the, the letters, um, you know, SBTN, TNFD, um, we need to be aligned with, with those frameworks so that companies make it as easy as possible for companies to understand what their impacts, dependencies, disclosures are, and how they should be then investing in nature um, beyond you know, their direct um, mitigation uh, strategies. Um, so that alignment, I think, is going to be really important. Um, and again, the, the ease of it, uh, companies are just now really starting to get their heads around this concept. Um, if they've started, uh, so the easier we can make it for them, the better. Thank you. And Tommy, from a um, from a ratings perspective, perhaps perhaps you can offer some reflections. Um, sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah. So, I guess a couple of things. Firstly, I just pick up from where Sinclair left off. In a system of rules, you need uh, a standard or a series of methodologies from which people can seek to pass that test, whatever that test may be. Um, and you also need an agreed outcome. So this is kind of what you uh, were saying. Um, the really challenging thing with, with any form of natural capital asset, particularly when you're trying to actually create a nature in general, is, is this concept of fungibility um, and a ton of CO2 in, you know, in, in Kenya or in Brazil or in, in London is, is the same. Um, a unit of biodiversity as the UK's you know, net, net, uh, net accounting system is showing uh, is tricky in Shropshire versus Gloucestershire, let alone um, you know, Kenya and Brazil. So you have to have an agreed set of rules and you have to have an agreed concept of what it is that you're actually delivering. Um, but where kind of our business comes in into carbon and hopefully increasingly into other areas as they develop is the type of analysis that, you know, to speak a bit financially here, that risk takes is, you know, the more money involved, the more questions it asks, basically. And the depth of those questions gets never ending because effectively a price is just value at risk or the distribution of risks as agreed by a bunch of people in a social contract. And so if that is the case, you need to have more and more and more information, disclosure transparency from the providers and the, and the transactors, and obviously better quality interrogative tools. So ratings come in because you know, you can't definitively, well, certainly with carbon, you can't deliver a ton of carbon and you can't observe it. And the analysis is counterfactual. And to be an economist, you can prove anything counterfactually. So, you know, you have to go in and you have to check these things. Now, the standards are fantastic because they set these rules which allow equivalence, but there are variations in outcome. And so where we come in is to understand the variations in outcome. Now, why that's helpful is because money at risk is trying to say, you say it's this, but I want to understand to what extent if your only test is you know, pass or fail, then you, they don't provide that outlet for that interrogation to take place. And I used to be a, an analyst, a, like a macro analyst at a bank, and basically when people are kind of going in and comparing and contrasting these things, you walk into a meeting and it's just a million questions. And so you know, where we come in is trying to provide some of what I would call information infrastructure to provide the way in which people can ask those questions and get more comfortable. So it's like a layering effect. It's not. Uh, it's not either raw, standards are essential, and then you have something like information discovery infrastructure to allow that to circulate. And together, the two, with good transparency and disclosure, can actually create a scalable sort of supply side information infrastructure. And so if we keep on the, the theme, Tommy, obviously nature is so much more complicated yeah. than carbon. So from a rating perspective, how, how will you? So I'll give just a couple of examples in, in carbon. So. For example, one of the things we look at is additionality. So um, for afforestation or for ecosystem or nature-based solutions, having native species in that area has two benefits. One, additionality, because typically you would only plant non-native for commercial reasons. So even just on a straight up sort of light for light basis, you're not gonna plant palm, palm oil in a tropical forest for you know, it doesn't, wouldn't make any sense. So additionality to maintain that forest is obviously higher for, for native. Second is permanence. You have much stronger uh, you know, natural system, natural ecosystems from drought, fire, all types of preservation techniques that ecosystem services provide in resilience terms. So your non-permanence is also stronger. So that's just sort of some examples of how you can actually, you can use this to affect um, analysis. In terms of quantifying it, there's various ideas. Um, one would be, looking at equivalence of uptick. So saying you have, what is a 1%, 10% improvement on its own terms in this locality. Um, 
I was talking to the team and alpha, beta and gamma diversity are incredibly complicated. It's a bit like derivatives trading. Um, but that's also very important to, to take count of. So where is your, basically, where do you draw your circle? Is it around the park? Is it around the city? Is it around the, the states, you know, sort of thing? And then you say, okay, well, equivalence in this area, so a plus or minus 5% is equivalent to a plus or minus 5% decay in some other area. So you're not saying it's the number of elephants or the number of, you know, ferrets that are going around in certain areas. But, it, but that, that is a slight problem. So one of the slightly bizarre ways of thinking of equivalence in nature is if you were to improve the health of 100 species, but one were made extinct, I mean, is that better or lower biodiversity? I, I don't, you know, that, that's just a question which we're going to, if you want to try to bring financial capital at risk into that thing, that's a, some, almost a Faustian pact for some people. But that's something that you have to sort of have, to have an articulation of or an agreement of. And maybe there's thresholds, maybe you know, no extinction is, is considered best and then, but these are all things that you just don't confront with other types of more commodity-like nature, uh, environments like carbon, for example. Mm -hmm. And Stefan, from um, a listed equity impact investing perspective, what attributes are you looking at from a, from a nature perspective? So I, I may have a, a different angle here because listed equities uh, just uh, arrived um, in the biodiversity uh, investing arena and the first fund uh, were launched probably last year. Um, when we look at listed equities in biodiversity, we need to consider that we want to have an impact on biodiversity loss, but at the same time, we are more and more on, on this planet. Uh, we just reached 8 billion uh, last December. We're going to go to 10 billion over the next 30 years. Economic growth was mentioned earlier, and I completely agree with uh, changing the goal. But I think, unfortunately, and similar to uh, uh, the feedback we could hear this morning, unfortunately, I would say over the next three, five years, economic growth will still be a, a goal. So we need to realize that. And at the same time, uh, you've got the uh, climate change issue that we need to address, and we would argue that you can't address climate change without addressing biodiversity at the same time. So when you put all of that into consideration, there are three things we look at. The first one, which is quite key uh, to, um, uh, to us, is what are the biggest issues? And for us, there are three main issues. Agriculture and the overall uh, food sector. And we we'll always say that uh, agriculture is to biodiversity what the energy sector is to climate change. So we we'll try to address that. The two other main topics for us are uh, freshwater resources, which is not increasing proportionally to the number of people on, on this planet. And the third one is linked to packaging, plastic, and recycling. So we try to address those three main issues in order to be able to move the needle quite rapidly. The second element is scale. And one of the benefits of listed equity is the full support of capital market. So trying to address big issues with companies which could be innovative. And if they are innovative and providing the right solutions, the right innovation to address the three main topics that we have mentioned, they will get the full support of capital market and have uh, ultimately a bigger impact on biodiversity loss, probably in a, uh, in a, in a short period of, uh, in a short period of time. The last element that we look at is um, reporting, because I know many people in this room, or most people, care about biodiversity, environmental related issues. Probably if we do a list, uh, this will, biodiversity will come up as the first or second topic for us. But for many investors out there, it's probably the fifth or tenth topic on their priority list. Uh, and regulation will help to put uh, biodiversity at the back of the list. But I'm completely, I'm completely in line with what I heard. You need, in order to have proper regulation, you need standards, metrics. Uh, at AXA, we are part of uh, the TNFD uh, um, working group on uh, metrics and target. And we have also done some investment on uh, probably one of the leading biodiversity footprint data provider, Iceberg Data Lab, uh, three years ago. Uh, so we are completely engaged and involved. But why we are completely engaged and involved? It's because 
if we want biodiversity to be at the top of the list, regulation will help us. And in order for people to adopt regulation, you need metrics and targets. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to pick up a little bit on the collaboration element. Um, at EY, we did a collaboration with the Natural History Museum on the biodiversity and techness indices. And the use case was a collaboration between an asset manager, um, ourselves, and the Natural History Museum. And the outcomes were launched at COP15 um, in December. The process, though, of collaboration around the complexities of applying metrics and targets to a real asset to take a current state assessment of one indice, um, do a historical um, look around you know, what was that asset then and then predict in the future is hugely, hugely complex. And it does really, does really require collaboration of more parties than just one. And so, um, Johan, I'd love to put you on the spot a little bit just from a Federated Hermes perspective. We heard from the Right Honorable John Glenn this morning about the fund that you, you will be collaborating with. So reflections from your perspective on complexities and opportunities. So I think you, <clears throat> I love your, your, your introduction of that around complexity and the fact that you almost inevitably end up collaborating with multiple stakeholders to achieve anything in this in this area. And certainly that's true. We're not the asset manager that you mentioned um, working with the Natural History Museum on your particular project, but we do work with the Natural History Museum on our own biodiversity equity fund. On the, the strategy that John Glenn mentioned, uh, DEFRA have put forward 30 million pounds of first loss seed capital very deliberately to help uh, crowd in private finance into the sector so that we can invest both in the real assets at scale, but also to help build the infrastructure that goes around that. And that's all of the things that Sinclair, uh, Tommy and Stefan have talked about. And, and without all of those component pieces, it's pretty clear that we won't actually achieve anything. Uh, they need to grow hand in hand, both the investment in the real assets and the ecosystem or infrastructure piece around that. Tommy, please. Can I just add, I think one of the, um, the sort of possibly the easiest, uh, the least complex, um, if you let me go there, part of this is the demand side. Um, what you're hearing, and you probably hear a lot of, is lots of fascinating um, supply side reform, so systems of transactions, systems of information exchange, systems of, of, of rule setting. Um, but the demand side is basically what will you know, we'll, we'll live or die, you know, we'll make this thing um, die or not. And in that instance, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, we heard from some corporates earlier. Either you, you know, you have to recognize the impact in terms of, like, you know, fi uh, financialize the externality of your impact. So you have to measure those accurately, understand what that price would be. Um, and then you have to say, okay, well, we are going to either tax it, regulate it, or create a market solution for it. There's only three things that you can do to tackle these things. Could be all three. Could be could be a combination of them. You know, there's different different solutions. But the moment that there is a bid, uh, there is a price associated with this, and someone's got to go out there and go, I want this off my balance sheet. I want this away from me as far as possible. I want to get rid of this cost. Then all of these things kick into gear. Mm -hmm. But the, the 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 difficulty, whilst you know, and one of the interesting kind of conversations is the voluntary carbon market voluntary. You know, if this is a voluntary setup, you don't really ever build the bid for this. So, you know, it, it's really voluntary by definition action, um, which, is in, which is problematic, we think. And so bringing in that conversation, which any geographer would have seen the Club of Rome stuff, you know, that was, that whole conversation there was, well, why are we paying for all these things? Why are we changing this? And it only really works if suddenly, I think there's different numbers, 10 trillion, 20 trillion, to have everyone to, you know, value some of the natural services that we have. That suddenly is an asset class. That would be the third or the fourth biggest asset class in the world behind um, you know, bonds, um, equities, and then if you don't include currencies, then commodities. And so actually that's very serious. But for the time being, it's tiny. And the reason it's tiny is because basically there's no, there's no demand. And so what I, I guess what I'm saying here is you have all this interesting supply side reform, which I think many people here set up and trying to invest in. But until people go, right, yeah, I really do have to get rid of this thing. I do have to invest in this change, whether it's regulated or otherwise. It's very hard to see this really sort of catching light. 
So on, on the demand, if I can pick that up, and this is not in our script, um, Stefan, so bear with me. Um, perhaps one gap, if I can be a little bit provocative, is the role of the asset owner. So in the audience, we have your clients, right? AXA clients are in the, in the audience. So the role of the asset owner and or insurance company, what role from a demand side, if I pick up on Tommy's point, um, what role do you believe that the asset owner plays in creating the demand, perhaps um, driving comparability, standardization, etc.? So at AXA level, there is um, the insurance group and uh, I'm, I'm part of the asset, manager, asset management arm, but on the, uh, the group part, uh, we are an asset owner and we do the right thing in terms of mm -hmm. uh, committing to uh, uh, and being involved in terms of uh, biodiversity footprint mm -hmm. and we are part of various private and public uh, initiatives um, uh, there. Um, as an investor, of course, there are two parts of uh, AXA investment managers. When we talk about biodiversity, um, uh, we need to walk the talk, uh, as we say, and obviously in uh, the way we run our operations, we need to do the right thing. Um, a simple example, well, we've got, we have increased our exclusion in terms of uh, deforestation, in terms of investment for our clients, but also when we do uh, events uh, like that, we have implemented uh, a, a ban on uh, red meat, for instance, uh, uh, going forward. So it's the type of things we do as, um, as a company uh, in terms of uh, small initiative we can do as an asset manager in our operations. Where I think we've got the biggest impact is in uh, two aspects. Uh, in terms of investors and helping our clients is the first one uh, providing solutions which will help our clients to have uh, a significant and rapid impact on biodiversity. Whether we do it through private equity, we have launched private equity strategy in this area almost for a decade and we were one of the first to launch uh, listed equity strategy and we are one of the biggest after a few months of running the strategy with more than 500 million of asset under management in this area in the listed equity space which is probably uh, uh, one area which will grow quite rapidly uh, over the next uh, two to three years. So investment solution is the first aspect and the second aspect uh, is uh, in terms of Regulation. Everybody, every time I'm doing meetings, uh, and I'm traveling a lot uh, in, uh, in my role from uh, Asia, including Australia, to the US, and in many countries in, in Europe, and you may have noticed the French accent, but I think it's worth mentioning uh, uh, France is, is, uh, is leading with, uh, I think, the UK and the Netherlands in, in Europe, and some French institutions had to follow a specific regulation in France in order to report already on climate change and biodiversity loss. It's what the, the AXA group has done last year, reporting uh, in line with the first few recommendations from TNFD. TNFD is not finalized, but we have already established a report last year and we'll keep doing it, uh, having those type of reports on both climate change and uh, biodiversity. But I think our role for our clients is also pushing the boundaries. Uh, I've mentioned our role uh, in terms of the working group at TNFD for metrics and targets. And I think a best illustration of what we do in terms of commitment is um, investing in the company I've mentioned, Iceberg Data Lab, which will uh, be one of the players probably, uh, which will uh, uh, provide uh, a solution in terms of biodiversity footprint to clients, to asset managers, or to corporates in the same way you had a carbon intensity being developed over the last few years post the Paris Agreement. And our role is to establish and help st having a standard in terms of metrics and targets for our clients, our partners, but also trying to support the development of tools in order to accelerate the implementation of the regulation from clients, partners, governments or corporates out there. Thank you. Um, 
Sinclair, from a standards perspective, if I come back to the frameworks and perhaps the time element that it takes internationally to adopt an international standard, um, one of the lessons learned that is embedded into the TNFD, the, the nature element this year, is bringing the likes of the big four to the table to um, take an opinion or a view on internal controls and the confidence of, of the data. That was one of the lessons learned from the implementation of the TCFD. So from your perspective around the standards and the time or the pace of potential evolution or getting it embedded, do you have a view on the pace of change required? Yeah, I mean, of course, we need change to happen quickly. If we want to halt nature loss by 2030, we have a lot of work to do. Um, that said, I think there's, kind of to Tommy's point earlier, there's a lot of sort of supply of people ready to develop projects and generate these assets, and the demand isn't quite there yet. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to do on educating um, companies, investors, asset holders on, on what this is, what it means, what is the motivation behind it, um, why would you uh, buy a credit um, or invest. So there's a huge education uh, component and because that is going to take some time, I think we need to be careful about how we develop these standards, methodologies. There's several of them out there, VAR is not the only one um, creating a methodology around biodiversity um, and there's some questions that we need to answer now or quite soon and, and be sure that we get those right. And there's others that we can take time um, to kind of learn by doing. Um, we can't let perfect be the end of the, of the good. I think that was said earlier. Um, and so we do need to act now um, while sort of letting things play out a bit um, and not stifle innovation too soon in this new market. So when you look, when we look at um, the TNFD, TCFD and I'm not sure if I've heard the acronym yet, the TPT, Transition Pathway Task Force, TPT. Um, in those value stacks for disclosures, every one of them has metrics and targets. Um, and as we know at EY, there, we currently have a t access to a ton of data, but not all data is useful and or decision useful. So I guess I open it to the, to the panel in this regard because um, when we're trying to achieve decision useful, transparent, outcome-based activities, engagement and disclosures, how do we know which data is actually useful and which metrics will actually be relevant to achieve the targets? It's the, uh... <laughs> I would say that the challenge with putting a price, I mean, the, the theme of this, you could say the conference is, if, can you put a price on nature? And the challenge with that is it has to be reductive. And, you know, philosophically, you could argue that that's the whole point of nature. It's not reductive. It's a, it's a dynamic ecosystem. So herein lies the, lies the challenge. I think you're never going to get it right first time. What's important is to measure it as much as possible, I think, and then to try to have periods of learning quite regular periods of learning where you start understanding these things. Um, but it's quite frontier stuff uh, doing this. Trying to bring capital markets in line with conservation is very frontier. As a modal shift in economic theory, I think it's the biggest change since pre-fossil fuels. I think it's really sort of, you know, end of the, at the, end of the agrarian revolution type, type change. And so that's just gonna be quite interesting. And, and all I can say is, you know, measure more try to understand and be very clear about what you're, what you're valuing and then try to learn from it and try to you know, iterate around the unintended consequences. Um, because I think being, you know, yeah, that's, that's the only balance you can, I, I think I can. Uh, I, I would echo that um, it's not gonna be perfect from day one. Um, in the same way, um, EAG wasn't perfect uh, from day one and you had a lot of different providers and then, um, um, some consolidation with the data providers. I think we're going to go through the same uh, pathway, but what is sure is that um, we need to start, and we need to start now. Um, TNFD uh, will be uh, hopefully in place by the end of the year. I think uh, by September we need to find agreement and uh, 
uh, set up some uh, standard in terms of measure and, and target, and maybe it will evolve. In the same way, I think, when you look at the Paris Agreement and what we've done over the last uh, eight years, mm -hmm. uh, we have changed, we have improved the level of uh, data, the credibility of the data, we know who is more credible in terms of uh, the data provider. So I think we'll go through the same pathway, probably will be faster in, determi in determining who is uh, uh, credible and, uh, and what tools we want to use because we went through ESG, we went through climate change data and we are still uh, improving the data there and I think on biodiversity angle um, it will be better and sharper. Um, you know, and I'm going to um, bring up the word of offsets and see if you have any reflections as it relates to nature. Sure. So, <clears throat> well, anecdotally, as, as we left the room for coffee earlier, I overheard a conversation in which one individual turned to the other and he said, oh, isn't this marvelous? We've only had one mention of carbon credits so far. So I'm about to throw that out of the water. So apologies to whoever that was in the, in the room. I think inevitably, if we are thinking of nature as, a, as an asset class and we are seeking to derive direct economic benefit in addition to the, uh, the common good, benefit that exists from nature, then inevitably we'll be seeking for, we'll be looking for ways to, to monetize uh, n nature gain and nature recovery. Part of that will be from the selling of carbon offsetting and sequestration, uh, as it will be from biodiversity credits as well. But of course, it's, that's very easy and trite to say. It really is how you go about doing that in a way that it is both to, to both Tommy and, and uh, Stefan's point, it's got to be science-based and it's got to be high integrity. Um, the danger in some sense, as, as Stefan alluded to, is if we do go down this path of, of uh, this is the path that ESG investing went down, we'll end up in a situation in which accusations of greenwashing are, are widespread and many of them actually probably quite justified. So whatever we do, we need to try and avoid that to the, uh, to the nth degree. Thank you. And just as we start to bring this panel to, to close, um, Tommy, what I'm going to do is invite everybody to offer one practical outcome either for all of us that we can take away from, from this day and potentially focus on to accelerate the process. And so starting, starting with you from a rating agency's perspective, if you have one ask of all of us, what should we be doing and focusing on? Start paying for your impact. <laughs> there you go. You in? Uh, seize the opportunity. So we are, we live in a world that is blessed with this viable natural resource and it's something we can do something with. Today's the day. Stefan? trying to anticipate uh, things, whether it's on the data side or uh, the asset manager you are choosing uh, in order to manage your assets or any decision you take um, within your company. I'm going to give you one example, which is always linked to the fact that climate change needs to be addressed with uh, biodiversity. Uh, one of the things we do right now term, as an investor is trying to identify uh, solutions we bring to climate change, but where there are so still some question marks. Uh, one of them is on uh, sustainable transport. Uh, governments, uh, companies are supporting uh, electric vehicles, and we are committing to that. And it could be the right solution, and everybody is pushing for that. Uh, but at the same time, you've got some question mark. For instance, uh, adopting more le electric vehicles means more uh, lithium. You need to produce by 2040 probably 40 times more lithium than today. So biodiversity can find solutions to that. You can have innovative companies which are working on finding solutions to those type of climate change related uh, issues. Uh, one example is one company called Vulcan Energy which is uh, extracting, well, uh, producing lithium without uh, mining, without uh, water evaporation, so less harmful for biodiversity and the natural ecosystem. So try to anticipate those type of uh, issues and, and topic and look for 
companies or solutions which are uh, providing uh, a proper answer to the broader environmental topic. Not just biodiversity in isolation, but usually it's always biodiversity linked to climate change and addressing the overall environmental topic. Sorry, a really long answer for a short question, <laughs> but I guess it shows my passion about the topic. Um, yeah, I guess I would add <clears throat> just recognizing that the, we have a major need for collaboration and being constructive in that collaboration. Um, you know, we can write the standard and the methodology, which hopefully we'll be able to do by the end of the year, but that's still just a piece of paper at the end of the day. It requires a lot of different actors to actually um, you know, implement activities on the ground all the way to making responsible investments up to the corporate and investor level. And we need every single you know, actor organization along the way to participate and help us get to where we want to go, recognizing it won't be perfect um, at the start. Thank you. That was going to be my, my closing <laughs> remark around um, collaboration. Having, having, led one of, uh, having led a biodiversity collaboration with indices, standard makers, a real asset, and then ourselves, it's, it's not easy. And it, does, it took, took us twice as long as we anticipated. So collaboration is key. So on behalf of the audience, thank you. Thank you very much for this panel and your presentation. Thank you.